Good morning, everyone. I just want to welcome all of the schools that are already in the in the meeting, in the lesson. I know it's cold and it's early for a holiday day, but thank you so much to the teachers and the and the learners that have given up some of their time in order to do these back um, on track sessions. Um, and join us this morning for the nervous system chapter of life sciences. I'm going to give everyone just two more minutes. It is eight o'clock now, but I do see we probably still have some schools that are joining. Um, for those of you that are already with us, um, if you could please turn to page 24 in your learner booklets. We're going to start again with the post with the pretest for the nervous system. Um, today, I would like if the teachers at the various schools could just afterwards and after we've marked it, gather a bit of an average for me and post that in the in the chat. So if on average it's four out of 12 or five out of 12 or nine out of 12 or whatever the case may be, if you can post that in the chat. Um, if schools would like to start answering those now, then they can, and I will check in in two minutes. Good morning, everybody. I see we've got a few more schools that have joined us. If we can please turn to page 24 in the learner books. And if the learners could please answer the human nervous system pretest at the back um, of their booklets, it's the biological terms. And we will, I'm going to give everybody five minutes. I did let some start a bit earlier, but I'm going to give everybody five minutes from now to complete that, and then we will go over it as an introduction to today. For those that would like to perhaps complete it together or um, or don't have their books with them, I've included them on the screen. So if those are the terms that I would like you to do.
Morning for the schools that have just joined us. Um, you've got three minutes left to complete this pretest. If you're able to complete it, please. I will check in with you in three minutes. Right, good morning everybody. I've <laughs> apparently my camera was on. I do apologize for that. Um, you got to all see me in my in my gown. It's cold where I am, and um my children are all still waking up, so I grabbed the warmest, closest thing I could find. <laughs> um, but good morning to everybody. For those of you that have just joined us, um, the learners have been doing this pretest and I did make a request at the beginning. Teachers, as I go through these answers with everybody, if you could please just gather a bit of an average tally for your school. So just an on average what your score was out of 12. I know the numbering seems a bit strange. It's just because it continued from the work we did the other day. Um, so I'm going to post these answers. If you could please... Sorry, if you could please mark your own work and then give yourself a total out of 12. I'm not going to discuss these um, explanations just yet. We will do that um, as we go through our material this morning. So I'll just give you a minute to check your answers. Please remember that if a word, ha uh, if a term has two words in it, both of them need to be present. And the word should be spelt as correctly as possible without changing its meaning. So something like corpus callosum, just remember, should not be corpus luteum. All right, if, if a few schools could please just add their tally to the chat, then we can see how everyone is doing to start with. Then at least we have a baseline to, to go from.
Uh, Mrs. Taylor, I see Perseverance is asking if you can make the font a bit larger. Um, I think maybe the easiest for now would be just for you to read the answers and the numbers out to the schools. Sure, I can do that. Um, yeah, sorry, I am unable to make it any larger than it currently is, um, but I will read it out. So for the first one, it's technically number 13. The answer is cranium. Number 14, peripheral. Number 15, synapse. Number 16, corpus callosum. Number 17 is Alzheimer's. Number 18 is myelin sheath. Number 19 is medulla oblongata. Number 20 is multiple sclerosis. And remember, no abbreviations in the biological term section, so this may not be MS. Number 21 is parasympathetic. Number 22 is meninges. Number 23 is autonomic. And number 24 is medulla oblongata again. Okay. So if you're able to, a few schools add your totals. And we'll see if we get any improvement by the end, which hopefully we will. Right, today I'm going to do things slightly differently to, our, to how I did it last time. Um, last time I very much um, went through the notes with you first as a, as a revision and then went through the questions. Um, but today I would like to do questions more throughout the session. So I'm going to do um, a little section of notes and then the questions based on that section of notes. And today I would like to give you a little bit more time to try the questions yourselves before I just go through the answers with you. All right, so if you can please just be ready for that um, and then I will mark it. All right, I wanted to just point out to you learners that this chapter on responding to the environment in humans, which includes the nervous system, the eye and the ear, um, is a total of 54 marks of paper one. So that means that it is more than a third of your paper. So human reproduction that we did the other day was almost a third, and this is just over a third. So these two chapters alone is more than half of your paper one exam. So very important that you know um, what is happening in these chapters. Right, a quick little run through of the exam guidelines. Um, that you have in your booklets. I think for you, this is on page 11, if you would like to turn there with me. Um, I'm just going to run through this very briefly. So you need to know what the human nervous system is for. And then with regards to the nervous system, it's broken up into the central and peripheral nervous system. And the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. And you need to know the um, location and functions of the different parts of the brain, right? So what they, where they are in a diagram and what they do. Then the peripheral nervous system is all of the nerves that come off from that central nervous system. And in the exam guidelines, it seems like these are two different things, but really this autonomic nervous system fits under the peripheral nervous system. So it is part of the peripheral nervous system. Um, and then we've got the structure and functioning of a nerve. So you need to know about sensory and motor neurons and what they do and how a reflex arc works. We will go through that today um, with some revision and some questions. Please note that within your exam guidelines, it tells you which labels you would have to know for a diagram. So some notes and textbooks have extra uh, extra labels on their diagrams, which is fine, but these are the ones they want you to focus on and these are the ones they would ask you about. Okay, 
Um, then with regards to a reflex arc, again, these are the parts of a reflex arc that they can ask you about. So when you are studying, remember I told you the other day, use these exam guidelines to tick off for yourself. Do you know all these different things? Right, then um, the disorders of the central nervous system, there are only two, and you just need to know what, they're what they are caused by and what their symptoms are briefly. And then when it comes to the receptors, we are going to do the ear, eye and the ear just now. Okay, so if we go to my slideshow again, let's do a bit of a combination of revision and and notes um, or questions, should I say. Right, so this is a little breakdown just to show you how everything in the nervous system fits together. Um, so we have the nervous system overall and its responsibility is to help control and coordinate everything in your body. You've got two systems for uh, for control in your body, the nervous system and the endocrine system. And today we're focusing on the nervous system. Right, so we've got the central nervous system and the central nervous system consists of your brain and your spinal cord. So central, think in the middle. And then peripheral means to the sides. So everything coming off your spinal cord is your peripheral nervous system. And that peripheral nervous system has your sensory pathways. Um, if you think of this as part of a reflex arc, your sensory pathways are the things coming towards your peripheral nervous system or towards your central nervous system from the body. And then the motor pathways are the things coming from your peripheral nervous system or from your central nervous system out via your peripheral nervous system towards your body. Okay. Then this can be divided into two sections again, your somatic nervous system and your autonomic nervous system. Somatic, soma means, um, means body. So if you think of you controlling your body, Somatic nervous system is voluntary. It's everything you choose to do or you do on purpose with thinking about it. Your autonomic nervous system is involuntary. So I always think autonomic sounds like automatic. It happens on its own without you controlling it. So things like breathing, heart rate, your digestive system, all of those things that happen on their own. And this autonomic nervous system is further divided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic division. So your sympathetic division is what is going to get things moving or things happening faster. So increased breathing rate, increased heart rate, um, if you think of fight or flight, if you've done that um, at school already, the fight or flight mechanism, it is preparing you for that fight or flight. It's dilating your pupils so that you can see more clearly those kinds of things. Whereas parasympathetic is going, is the rest and digest side of things. It's the slowing everything down, returning things to a norm, more relaxed and normal state. Okay, so this is how the nervous system is kind of divided up and grouped together. Now, in your booklets, um, you have, after the multiple choice and the biological terms, you will find this. I know it's a little bit small on the screen, but you've got it larger in front of you in your booklet. Um, I've just included it on the screen for those that perhaps don't have their book with them, but I am unable to make it any bigger. Um, but if you could please do question 1.4 in your booklet, I'm going to give you five minutes to answer those questions.
morning for those that just joined us. We are busy with the representation of the nervous system. If learners could please answer the question 1.4 in their learner booklets. I'm going to be giving you another two minutes to do so. Right, good morning again. <laughs> um, let's go through these answers. All right, so um, I know that for some schools, the presentation of this might be a little bit small, but like I said, you do have it in your booklets in front of you. So if it is a bit small, please refer to the page in front of you. I'm just using this to point out and as a reference to, to what we are talking about. Um, so the question stem says the flow diagram below represents the components of the nervous system. So remember I said to you the other day, always try to make sense of the diagram first before you look at the questions. Right. So this is essentially a um, flow diagram that I had on the slideshow a few minutes ago. Um, but this is also exactly how it was represented in the past paper question. So the central nervous system is divided into two parts, the central nervous system, and then I now know that the other side of it is the peripheral nervous system. Um, the central nervous system is divided into brain and the spinal cord. A, the peripheral nervous system, is divided into cranial nerves, and you need to have learned that this would be the spinal nerves. Remember, I'm not yet answering the questions. I'm making sense of this diagram for myself. So in your exam, have a pencil in your hand and write in what you already know. The cranial nerves and the spinal nerves are part of something. And maybe you would have forgotten what that is. But here they give you a bit of a clue. So if this is the sympathetic nervous system, then this one must be the parasympathetic nervous system. And these two things fall under the autonomic nervous system. The one that is automatic, the one that happens on its own without our thinking about it or controlling it. Right, so now let's look at the questions. Um, hopefully Sorry you... to interrupt you, Mrs. Taylor. Yes. I just wanted to let you know, in the chat, I see that Perseverance nailed this question they got every single one of those right that you just went on that you just explained to us yay well done perseverance that's amazing congratulations and i hope it's the same for others that perhaps aren't posting their answers in the chat so let's go through these questions it's great to know that um you guys are getting it which is wonderful um Question 1.4.1 asks you to identify the component of the nervous system represented by. Remember, identify, they just want you to give the label. So what would it be called? No description or anything like that. Okay, remember to read the question carefully. So you just need to give a one word answer here. I will show you the memo just now, but I want to just go through the answers while the questions are in front of you. So the answer for A, as we already mentioned, because we've gone through this diagram and we've filled in what we can, it now becomes easy for us here at, 
to do the answers. So A is the peripheral nervous system. Technically, you'll see now in the memo, nervous system is in the question. So if you just write the word peripheral, it's fine. The tick is on peripheral. Then D, D is the autonomic nervous system. Be careful to spell it correctly. Not automatic, although it acts as a system that is automatic, it is called the autonomic nervous system. And automatic means something different. So um, or it has its own meaning. So you need to spell that correctly. Then name the type of nerves found at C by going through this. That's the spinal nerves. And then be careful for questions like 1.4.3. They ask for the letter and the name. And many learners we find um, at marking will give only the letter or only the name. But they're marked separately. So if you remember the one, not the other, then we can still give you a mark. So please remember to do both. So they want the letter and the name of the component that slows down the heart rate. So that will be E, the parasympathetic nervous system. OK, and then 1.4.4 asks you to name the nerve cells that make up nervous tissue. And that is in general, and it doesn't necessarily come from here, but the nerve cells are called neurons. And then state two ways in which the brain is protected. There, I'm going to put the memo up for you now so that you can have a look at what the options are. We've got meninges, which are the membranes that surround the brain. There are three layers of meninges, but we don't need to know the separate names. We just need to know them as a whole, the meninges. Then you've got your actual bone of your cranium that protects your brain. And then you've got your cerebrospinal fluid, which is the liquid that bathes the brain as an, and is inside the spinal cord. So any two of these. OK, so here you can see how the tick is not on nervous system. It's on peripheral spinal nerves. And here we give a tick for the letter and the answer for 1.4.3. Something I would just like to point out at cranium is this is often answered incorrectly as skull. So in life sciences, you need to make sure that you know the difference between the skull and the cranium. The cranium is the part that covers and protects the brain itself, whereas the skull is the cranium and all the bones of your face. So your cheekbones and your jaw bones, so your maxilla and your mandible, that is all together the skull. But your jaw bone, for example, doesn't protect your brain. So we can't say skull here. This must only be cranium. Okay. Right. So then um, we need to go on to looking at the brain itself and the different parts. So you'll see in your booklets, there are a number of questions um, where they give a diagram of the brain and they give questions on that. And that comes up often. So you can expect a question like that in your exams. Right, so let's start over here, <coughs> sorry, with A. I hope everybody is still with me. I want to get through as many questions in detail as possible today. So I'm going to spend a, um, I'm going to do the revision part a little quicker today than I did the other day. Right. So when we look at the brain, um, we've there are certain components or parts of the brain that we need to know. One of them is this band over here in the middle of the two hemispheres, and the this band in the middle is called the corpus callosum. And this is the one where the other day I said to you, you mustn't confuse it with the corpus luteum, which is in the ovary. OK, so this must be spelt correctly. Um, and a common error is that many people describe the corpus callosum as separating the two halves of the brain. 
okay, or the left and the right side of the brain, but it doesn't separate them as much as it actually connects them. So you need to say that it connects the left and the right hemispheres of the brain, right? And therefore, it allows for communication between the two parts or the two hemispheres of the brain. Okay, remember what we're looking at is a brain cut in half here. So we're only looking at half of the brain. Right, then over here, we've got the hypothalamus. It's very difficult to correctly identify exactly where the hypothalamus is. But if you, if, the, if a label is pointing anywhere to the center part of the of the brain and it's not pointing to a specific thing that you know it's not that band in the middle it's not this big part at the top it's not this little gland and it's pointing somewhere else there in the middle then the only thing it can be pointing to is the hypothalamus okay because sometimes they make the label line go to all sorts of places within here and the hypothalamus's job is uh, it's a control center for some of your kind of primitive needs. So hunger, thirst, sleep, and then it also is going to control your body temperature and your emotions. If they ask you for a function, you can just give any one of those. Right, then the cerebellum is at the back here. It's almost like a leaf-shaped structure, smaller and at the back, near the bottom of the brain. And again, Spelling is a very important here. If we look at the spelling of cerebellum and cerebrum, they're quite similar. So if you spelt them incorrectly, we won't necessarily know which one you meant to say. <clears throat> Sorry. So if, for example, you spelt this C-E-L-E, Celebrum, we, we won't maybe know that if you are meaning cerebrum or cerebellum. Okay, so that is a tough one. You need to practice writing it and so that you, you don't make a mistake there. Right, but the job of the cerebellum is to coordinate all of your voluntary movements. So voluntary movements are the things you choose to do. So it's walking. Talking, picking up your pen, writing in your book, um, eating, all of those things that you your brain is making a, a decision to do, the decision to do it and the control of it is coming from a different part of the brain. But the cerebellum's job is to coordinate those movements. So it helps for those movements to happen smoothly, right? And with balance so that you don't fall over or you look like you're walking all stiff like a robot, okay? So it helps to coordinate those movements to happen smoothly, and then it controls your muscle tension and your balance. Right, then the medulla oblongata is the, um, the base of the brain. Now, I would like to just mention something here that... This part of the brain you don't need to know the label of. And very often they um, the medulla oblongata's label goes here. A little bit, sorry, um, more in this region over here because this is now looking more like the spinal cord. Okay. So because of this, you're going to have to just read the questions very carefully with regards to what they're asking. Um, or or how the question is worded as to whether this would be referring to the medulla oblongata or a spinal cord. Okay, we'll look at some questions just now. Right, then um, the medulla oblongata's job is to transmit nerve impulses between the brain and the spinal cord because it's the, like, the link between the two. And then specifically its job is to control your um breathing and your heart rate, which are involuntary actions, okay, things that you don't control. And if this part of your brain, right, this base of your brain is damaged, then you will most likely die because you won't have a heartbeat anymore um, or your heart will stop beating and you will stop breathing. 
Okay, then this one here, this is the pituitary gland. Um, it's labeled, but they have not focused on notes because it's part of the endocrine chapter. But I just want to point out that because the endocrine chapter and this chapter are in the same exam, both in paper one, they do sometimes ask questions on the pituitary gland um, if they give you a diagram of the brain. Okay. Remember, that's the one that releases those hormones we spoke about the other day, LH and FSH. Right, and then this biggest part of the brain at the top here, that is the cerebrum. And the cerebrum's job is to control all your voluntary actions. And it helps with all your higher thought processes, so your decision-making, your thinking, your intelligence, and your memory. And then it also receives and interprets sensations from sense organs. In other words, information from your eyes for seeing, your ears for hearing, your tongue for tasting, all of those senses are all interpreted in the cerebrum. Okay, but these are the three categories of functions. Right, so let's try a question that focuses on this work that we have just done. Um, in your booklets, it's question 2.1. I know it's a bit small and a little bit squashed at the top there on my screen, but you can please look at your book. And I'm going to just give you three minutes because these are all short one word kind of answers. Three minutes to answer this question. Morning. So I keep saying morning every time I start. I've said good morning to you a few times now. Um, right. So let's go through the answers to this question. Right. So it says the diagram below shows some parts of the human central nervous system. And then we have a diagram of the brain. And as I've said before, always important to make sense of the diagram first. So although they only ask for identification of A and C, let's go ahead and label this whole diagram for ourselves quickly. So A, now here is what I was talking about before. Do you see that we've got a label, um, this kind of swollen part at the, at the very top of the spiral cord area? Um, in the brain we don't need to know the label of but here we have a label just below that and then we've got one further down so this is referring to the spinal cord so you can go ahead and mark 
um, that one A for yourself. If you said spinal cord, it must be spinal cord, not only spine and not spinal because you get spinal cord and spinal nerve. So we need to know exactly which one you're talking about. So spinal cord. B would have been the medulla oblongata. I know they didn't ask it, but remember we are just going through all the labels here quickly. So medulla oblongata, not only medulla, because you have a few medullas in your body of various types. The one in the brain is medulla oblongata. C is one of the ones they asked you. That is referring to this band in the middle. So that's the corpus callosum. D is the cerebrum and E is the cerebellum. Okay, so we've answered that one. Identify, you're just giving the names of the parts. Then for 2.1.2, it's one of those letter and name questions. So you have to give both. My suggestion is that you always write the letter and a little dash and then the, the, the name next to it. Or sometimes they ask for the letter and the function. So give the letter and then a little dash and then the function, what, depending on the question. Okay, so they want to know um, the part that has the center for interpreting taste. So taste is a sense. So the part that interprets all of your senses is D, the cerebrum. So D, cerebrum. Then regulates heart rate is the is B. Well, the question is B, but also the answer is B. Your heart rate is regulated by B, the medulla oblongata. And then is responsible for motor coordination. Remember, there is a difference. Here's the memo. A difference between coordination and control. Right? Controlling your voluntary actions is your cerebrum making the decision to pick up your cup and have a sip of your juice but the cerebellum coordinates it this part of the brain makes that movement happen smoothly okay so the answer for c is e cerebellum okay and i just want to show you as i said before we mark these two things separately so if on the day of your exam you know it's part d but you can't remember the name then write the letter d because we will still give you a mark for that okay they don't have to both be there to get any marks right but obviously to get both marks then then they both need to be there Okay, now I want you to skip a few questions and I want you to turn to question 3.3 because this question also refers to just the brain. And I'm going to just give you two minutes to answer this one because it's only four marks. Okay, so question 3.3. And I'll give you two minutes to try those ones. Okay, I know I'm going through some of these quite quickly, but this is very similar to the ones we've just answered. Um, we want to try and expose you to as many types of questions. So these ones that are very similar, I'm going to go through a little quicker. So when we look at the diagram of the brain, we had labeled these before. So 
identify part A, that is the cerebellum. I'm going to put up the memo quickly. That is the cerebellum. Note that here they did have a label for the pituitary gland on this particular diagram, although it's not asked about. Um, I just wanted to point that out. Then state two functions of part D. So part D is the cerebrum. Um, so on the memo, there I can't edit it because it came from a, a, a PDF, but I just wanted to point out that this answer is not correct. Okay. This coordinates voluntary movement should not be an option on the on the memo. That is the job of the cerebellum. So interpretation of sensations or senses is an option and then controls voluntary movement and higher thought processes okay i want to do also just say to you if you didn't say interpretation of senses but you gave an example so you said something like interpretation of hearing or interpretation of sight then that would be fine. We would accept that as interpretation of senses. But if they ask for two, and you say interpretation of sight, interpretation of hearing, then we will only mark one of them because they're both about the same thing. They're both about interpreting senses. Okay, so if you get a question like that, then you can give an example of one, but then that's all one function. You then need to give one of the other functions, right? And then question three, three, four, state one way in which the brain is protected. State, again, is just to kind of list or name it. Just give the answer with no explanation. We've got either the hard bony skull um, but this should say cranium, um, but the hard bony tissue or cranium or meninges. Okay, either one of those because they only asked for one of them. Okay, then question 3.4. Um, I, the identifying part A and B, um, that's nice and easy because we've done those before, but I would like you to try and focus quickly on these two, two mark questions. I'll quickly um, just go through them with you and then I would like you to try and answer them. So identify part A, this is the corpus callosum. Um, and the question after that is, explain why a person might die if part C is damaged. Explain means you have to give a why, a reason why. And then 343 three says part B is damaged in a person's lower back. So part B is the spinal cord. So what they're saying is way down in the lower back, that um, structure is damaged. The spinal cord is damaged. So identify B, spinal cord. Now I want you to think of explain why the person will have no control of their skeletal muscles of the legs. Okay, so I'm going to give you two minutes to think about those two questions or to come up with an answer for those two questions.
Okay, let's go through these two questions. Right, so explain why a person may die if part C is damaged. So first of all, they are wanting you, they are testing whether you understand what part C is for. And now, not just what it's for, but why that will have an impact if it was damaged. So you need to, in your answer, say that it controls a vital process or it controls breathing and heart rate. And therefore, if it's damaged, the breathing will stop or the heart rate will stop. So if we have a look at what the memo says, I know it's small for some of you, but it says it controls vital processes or you say what those vital processes are. So the medulla is responsible for your heartbeat and breathing. And if it's damaged, you need to acknowledge that those things will now stop. So if your heart stops or your breathing stops, then you die. Okay. So that's where the explanation comes in. Many learners just say it controls breathing. So explain why a person may die if it's damaged. They say it controls breathing. Now you are expecting your examiner or your marker to assume that since you know it controls breathing, you're expecting them to realize that you're trying to say, well, if it's damaged now, the breathing won't be working. But you need to actually say that, okay? You need to say the breathing and the and the the heart beat won't won't be working or will stop. All right. Don't leave anything to your examiner to think of for themselves. You need to put it on paper. Okay. Then B, explain why the person will have no control of the skeletal muscles of their legs. Again, many learners here just say because the spinal cord is damaged. But that's given in the question. We already know it's damaged. So now they want to know why, if it's damaged, why will they have no control? And that's because the impulses that are coming from the part that is meant to control it, which is the cerebrum, okay, the impulses from the cerebrum will not be transmitted or will not be taken to the skeletal muscles. And that's why there will be no control. Okay. Please note here, they haven't just said brain. Unless in grade 12, in your exam, unless they're asking, name the two parts of the central nervous system. And you're saying brain and spinal cord. Other than that, you may not just use the word brain. Okay. You always need to give the specific part of the brain that you're talking about. Right. So because they've said control, control is, comes from the cerebrum. You need to say that in your answer. Okay. Right. Those are the brain questions. Let's go on to the structure of a neuron. Okay, so I'm going to go through this part quite quickly, if you don't mind, um, because I'm assuming you've all been taught this already. Um, if some schools haven't, this consider this a brief little introduction. Um, but neurons, they might look different, but they all have certain structures that are common to all of them. So they have a cell body and then with a nucleus. And then they've got dendrites, right? Dendrites receive the impulse. The impulse is, is the electrochemical message. <clears throat> Sorry. So dendrites always take the message towards the cell body, the impulse. And the axon takes the impulse away from the cell body. So regardless of what the neuron looks like, that's always the pattern. Dendrites towards the cell body, axon away from the cell body. And that's the direction that the neuron kind of flows in. Okay, this looks like a lot, but I'm just going to touch on a few things. There are certain labels, like I mentioned at the beginning of today's lesson, that you have to know. It's only these ones, right? So nucleus, cell body, axon, and dendrite we just spoke about. 
Cytoplasm is just the liquid part of the cell inside the cell membrane. And myelin sheath is this thing that covers the axon. It's often drawn as little kind of little semicircles wrapped around the axon. <clears throat> Sorry. And that those are the labels you have to know. Right, then there are two main types of neurons you need to know. The motor neuron, also called the efferent neuron, or the sensory neuron, which can also be called the afferent neuron. Now, in looking at them, the thing you need to look for, the main difference, is the following. A motor neuron has lots of dendrites that enter the cell body. A sensory neuron may have a few dendrites on one side, but that dendrite only has one or two entryways into the cell body and then the axon. Okay, so that's what you need to look for in a diagram. So lots of individual little dendrites all entering the cell body or only just one entryway from the dendrites into the cell body. Right. Um, based on this diagram, they're showing you the direction of the nerve impulse because it always goes dendrite cell body axon. In this case, dendrite cell body axon. Okay. And then the other neuron you have to know about is an interneuron. They don't often include a big diagram of it. It's normally drawn in, in the context of a reflex arc um, or a reflex action. Um, but that's going to connect to these two. That's why it's called an interneuron or a connector neuron, because it is between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron inside the spinal cord. Okay. Right, so I'd like you to now turn back in your booklets to question 2.2 and answer these questions. Going to give you quite, oh, sorry, I'm quite aware of the time and we obviously still have other things to do. So I know I'm pushing you on time a little bit, but I would, I'm going to give you just three minutes. Okay, let's go through these. It was not a lot to answer in, in terms of how much to write because it was just um, just numbers. Um, 
So the question asks you to give only the numbers. Again, if you had to kind of name the neuron here, then you um, you wouldn't get any marks because they only want the numbers of two neurons that. Um, now, when you look at them, they look very similar, right? You notice that number one and number four look almost the same and number two and number three look almost the same. But when you look at them more closely, there is a big difference between number one and number four. They're the same type of neuron, but notice that this part here is not present on number four and the same thing over here, right? So the thing that's missing is the myelin sheath. Right. So um, transport impulses from the receptor to the central nervous system. Right. So the neurons that go from the from the receptor towards the central nervous system are your sensory neurons. So that would be number one and number four. Question two. We'll sorry, have to, a... sorry to interrupt you, Mrs. Taylor. I just wanted to let you know again. I'm monitoring the chat for us and perseverance once again answered uh, both option one and four to this question. So you they definitely on top of their game. Um, well I don't know if you want me to read the answers for the others as well. Sure, you can do that. So for two, 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 they said um, neuron one and three. Correct. And then for two, two, three, they said neuron two and three. Um, on damage of a person, yes, two and three, correct. Sure. Well done. Well done, Perseverance. That's amazing. I'm sure there are other schools that are also getting them right. Um, they may be just a little shy to put their answers in the chat. But just for the other schools that may have missed it, Number two's answers is number one and number three. And question three's answer is number two and number three. So well done there, Perseverance. Okay, right, let's quickly talk about reflexes. Um, so the reflexes are the two, two definitions here that are really important. Okay, the reflex action and the reflex arc. Arc refers to the pathway, okay? So if you have to kind of walk the route of the reflex, that's the reflex arc. So it's the pathway, the journey that the impulse is going to follow from the receptor all the way out until it leaves or it exits at an effector, right? So that's the pathway that an impulse follows from receptor to the effector to um, bring about a response. But the reflex action is about the action. It's about the, the doing. So it's a fast, automatic response, or you could have said involuntary response, by an effector to a stimulus. And these are two definitions you need to be very clear on and know. Okay, so when we have a look at a reflex, we're going to just quickly go through this. Um, there are different um, kind of zones. We don't worry about the white and the gray matter anymore. But this is the central canal where the cerebrospinal fluid will be, but this is the important part. So um, there's another diagram coming up now, but this was the central nervous system. So this is in the spinal cord, and this is the peripheral nervous system. So coming from the body through the back, over here. This is the front of the person. This is the back. Coming in here from the dorsal root, it's going to go round through the spinal cord and out of the ventral root. And in the root, root basically just means the like the pathway, if you think of it like that. There will be neurons inside here. So when we look at it like this, this outer line here, this is the root. But this little line inside is showing the neuron itself. Okay, so this would be the dorsal root. This would be the ventral root. But if we were talking about the neuron inside, then coming from the receptor, we've got the 
sensory neuron. Okay, so this is our receptor. In this case, it's the skin. It's whatever is going to respond to a stimulus. In this case, the candle is the stimulus. This neuron over here is our sensory neuron, which is bringing the impulse towards the central nervous system. Then we have, see the little gap here? That's called a synapse. Then we have our connector or our interneuron inside our spinal cord that connects our sensory neuron to the next one, which is our motor neuron. And our motor neuron moves through the ventral root all the way out to the effector, which is your muscle or your gland, whatever is going to elicit the response, the reaction that this requires, the stimulus requires. Okay, so I'm not going to go through these notes in more detail than that, but that pathway and that action you need to be able to explain and know what each of the parts are doing. Okay, so here's just another little visual for you. You've got a sensory neuron coming from the receptor, going into the spinal cord, linking with an interneuron, and then back out through a motor neuron to the effector, to the muscle. Right, so this question I'm going to do with you, all right? Um, just for the sake of time, because we still have to get to the eye and the ear, and there's another one I want you to try on your own. Right, so I would like to do this one with you. So it says, a boy steps on, now I've got something blocking um, my writing there. <laughs> but it says, a boy steps on a... Um, Do you want me to on read a nail. that for you, Mrs. Taylor? It's fine. I've got it now. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my sharing bar there. It's blocking it. A boy yeah, steps so on a nail <laughs> um, and pulls his leg away suddenly. Right, the diagram below shows the pathway taken to create his or this reaction. Right, so here's the pathway. Right, we're coming in always in at the back, right, and then out through the front. Right, so A is a sensory neuron, B is an interneuron, and then here is this difference that I was talking about earlier. D is the neuron itself. This is the motor neuron, the one that goes to the effector, the muscle. But C is the root. It's the, the general kind of um, the pathway. And this one in the front is the ventral root. So name the pathway represented by the diagram. This whole pathway that they're talking about is a reflex arc. Okay, remember, there's a reflex action and a reflex arc. So this is the reflex arc. One advantage of this type of reaction, so the advantage, I didn't re revise this with you, but reflexes, the whole point of them is to prevent your body from harm or injury. So because this all happens very quickly, it's to prevent you from getting hurt. So that if you step on that nail, you quickly lift your foot to reduce the damage, okay? So it's to minimize or to um, reduce harm to the body or injury. Part B, that is the little neuron inside the spinal cord. So that's the interneuron. Sorry, there's a duck nearby, if you can hear it through my computer. Um, C is the ventral root, and E is the effector or the muscle. Then give the name, the letter and the name of the neuron that transports impulses towards the spinal cord. So we want the one going towards. Now, you have to know that because they haven't got arrows. Sometimes they do show you with arrows in the diagram, but this one they don't. So you have to know the kind of the pattern of these pathways. So it's A is the mark for the letter and then sensory neuron for the name. They will also accept afferent neuron. 
Remember I said it's got two names. The way I remember it is the sensory neuron arrives. A for arrive to the spinal cord. A for afferent. And the motor neuron's other name is efferent because to me it's exiting the spinal cord. Okay. So that's those are the answers. Don't worry to write them down because you will get all of them. Okay, right. This one I want you to do on your own quickly. And then I'm going to quickly do a reflex arc description with you. And then we're going to start with the eye. So I'm going to just give you three minutes to answer this. Okay, right, let's mark these or we'll just um, check our answers. Um, uh, I want to first put this up. Right, so here we've got a diagram that is representing um, a reflex arc in, um, in a diagram and then diagram to just a motor, oh, sorry, um, a neuron. They don't tell you what type of neuron. Um, and they ask you various um, questions, right? I'm going to just jump straight into the questions. Um, layer E, this is the layer that you need to know the label of, which is the myelin sheath. Okay, you must have both myelin and sheath in your answer. And F is the axon. We know it's the axon because this is showing us the direction. So this must be the dendrite cell body, and this is the axon, okay? Then, which neuron, they only want you to write the letter, represents the type of neuron shown in diagram two. So that this type of neuron, you see, although we have many little, um, many little dendrite kind of, the beginnings of dendrites here, there's only one entryway into the cell body. Therefore, it is a sensory neuron. And then we've got um, another question which says, is damaged or which neuron is damaged? Oh, hold on. Sorry. Reading the wrong question. Um, which neuron A, B or C represents the type of neuron in diagram two? Sorry. It's a sensory neuron, yes. But a sensory neuron here is going to be A, this one that comes in at the back. So it's A. Or 242A. My apologies. Didn't read the question properly. And then B's um, question Which neuron is damaged when a person can feel the stimulus but cannot respond to it? So I thought that's a nice kind of way for me to quickly remind you that if the information from the receptor comes in at the sensory neuron 
and that neuron is working fine. Then it's going to get to the spinal cord, which will eventually go to the brain. So the person will feel it. If the neuro, if the, the impulse goes through C, then the person will be able to respond to it because it will get to the effector. But which one is damaged if they can feel it but cannot respond? Then C is damaged. A is working, but then the person can't respond to it, so C is damaged. And then give the letter and name of the part that ensures one directional flow of an impulse. In other words, the impulse can only travel in one direction and it can't start going backwards or anything like that. Mm -hmm. That is D, the synapse. One of the functions of that little space between the neurons is to ensure that the impulse travels in only one direction. Okay, now I am aware of the fact that we need to also do the eye and the ear. So I'm going to go through this one quickly with, unfortunately, without giving you time to try it on your own first, um, because I want to still give you some other questions on the eye and the ear. Um, but I would like you to put a little star next to this question because there's some nice things in here that are important for you to know. Okay, so here we've got a neuron, um, a certain type of neuron, diagram one and diagram two. And just as with before, we notice the only difference between them really is this myelin sheath that is missing in neuron two. Okay, and they ask, identify the type of neuron shown, many dendrites entering the cell body. So it is a motor neuron. Then using the letters, they want you to give the sequence of the impulse. In other words, what direction does this travel in? Okay, so it's for two marks, but you would only get the two marks if you have the whole sequence correct, only using the letters. So it comes in at the dendrite, so C, down the axon, B, and then out at A. So C, B, A, in that order. Right, now these two explain questions. They, The first one, number three, asks, explain how the speed, so how fast, the trans, uh, of the transmission of impulses will differ for neuron one and neuron two. Okay, so one of the functions of, or the main function of myelin, the myelin sheath, is that it insulates this axon. And by insulating the axon, it allows the impulse to travel faster. So, um, first of all, you need to answer the part of the question that requires you to say what the difference is. So you have to explain how the speed is different, right? So the how the speed is different is neuron one's impulse will travel faster than neuron two. But the explanation is because neuron two doesn't have myelin. Or you could say neuron two is going to be slower because it doesn't have myelin and neuron one does. Okay, but you need to say which one is faster and the why. Okay, you can't just say neuron one is faster or neuron one has myelin sheath and neuron two doesn't. Okay, you need to have both parts in, in your answer. I'll put the memo up in a second. And then explain why a person will feel the stimulus, but will not be able to respond if only this type of neuron is damaged. Okay, so that's very similar to the previous question we had. If this type of neuron is damaged, this is the one that goes to the effector. Okay, they're not talking about neuron one or two. They're just talking about this type of neuron. So when the motor neuron is damaged, the impulse can't reach the muscle, but the sensory neuron is still taking the impulse to the spinal cord. So the impulse is still going to be felt. It's just not, uh, the, the stimulus is still going to be felt. It's just not going to be able to be responded to. OK, 
Okay, so here we see this one's answer. Um, they wanted two marks for the impulse will be faster in neuron one, or you could have said slower in neuron two, and the reason. And this one, the impulse from this receptor or from the sensory neuron is still going to travel to the sense, uh, central nervous system. But the impulse will not reach the effector because the effector, uh, the motor neuron going to the effector was damaged. Okay, the was damaged part, it was in the question, so you don't need to repeat it in the answer. Okay, now I'm going to quickly go through these. These are my answers, the answers to those ones. Um, but I'm going to come back to those. I don't know if the preference, maybe um, the schools can just pop into the chat for me quickly. Would you rather me go through the nervous system, those multiple choice questions and whatever, because we only have 35 minutes left, or is the preference that I rather cover a bit of the eye and the ear? So if schools can maybe just type in there, either say brain, if you want me to rather do those questions, or if you would rather me go on to the eye and the ear, then type in eye ear. Just quickly in the next minute, just so that I can see what, because I don't think we're going to have time to do all those questions and the eye and the ear. At the moment, we've got one message saying eye ear. Um, and then another eye and ear, another eye and ear. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> so let's do that, yes. Yeah, so schools, um, you will be sent all of this as Jana mentioned the other day. So the answers and whatever to the multiple choice and the biological terms will come up. You will get them. So, but I think a lot of the concepts are repeated and we have covered quite a lot of that. So let's go on. Um, these exam tips um, are all things I've mentioned already while I've been going through everything with you. So, for example, the difference between a reflex action and a reflex arc. So those things I, I have covered. OK, right. So let's jump into the eye. So I'm not going to go through every single function here on the eye. I'm just going to point out a few little things to you that are sometimes common errors okay before we jump into those questions and if i have time i'll go back to some of those other things just now right so you have to be able to label a diagram of the eye they don't often ask the whole eye sometimes they just give you the front part of the eye and they ask questions on another concept with the labels um but you do have to be able to label all the different parts of the eye Okay, so a few things to quickly recap. The eye is made of three layers. The outer layer is the sclera, that's the white part predominantly for protection. Then this middle layer is the choroid. Remember the spelling of choroid shouldn't be confused with chorion in the reproductive chapter. And that's a pigmented um, layer that absorbs excess light. And then the inside layer is the retina, and that's the part that has those sensitive or light sensitive cells called rods and cones. Okay, so that's where the stimulus of light is interpreted, or not interpreted, but is um, received. So those are the receptors. Then the light that is received in the retina travels out of the eye via the optic nerve, and it will go to the cerebrum of the brain for interpretation okay where the optic nerve leaves the eye is the blind spot so if any images land here in this region you won't be able to see anything because the optic nerve is there and there are no photoreceptors so there are no rods and cones in this little spot over here right and that's why it's called the blind spot right then over here at the central to the pupil, right behind the, the lens in that line is what we call the yellow spot. And the yellow spot is where we have the highest number of cones or the highest density of cones. There are no rods there. And cones and rods are those photoreceptors that are light sensitive, but cones are for color. C for cone, C for color. 
and R, um, the, the rods, they are for seeing the differences in light and dark, so light intensity. So the clearest image happens where we only have our cones, which is here in the yellow spot. Um, just a little note, and it sometimes comes up in application kind of questions. Animals that are nocturnal, that see in the dark, they have more rods because than cones because that helps them see the difference between light and dark. Okay, then in the front part of the eye here, we've got our lens. Our lens is transparent and it refracts, which means bends the light so that it will land on the retina. Um, and this part of the eye is the iris. When we're looking at it from the side, that controls the size of the pupil. Now look here, the pupil is actually just a space. When you look at the eye from the front, the pupil is the black part, but it's not actually a physical structure. It's the space between the retina, uh, between, between the retina, sorry, between the iris, right? And the lens is behind it. And then in the very front of the eye, this part over here is called the cornea, and the cornea is transparent and it also bends the light. So the light coming in gets bent here and then here again. Okay. The eye is filled with fluid. This part in the front, uh, in the back part of the eye is called the vitreous humor, and in the front part of the eye is the aqueous humor, and that helps to give the eye shape. Okay, now I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but you do need to be able to explain, as I was going through this, what each part of the eye does and how it helps to, for the eye to function. Okay, I kind of went through that as I was busy with that diagram. Right, then there are two very important concepts in accommodation that you need uh, in the eye that you need to know. One is accommodation and one is papillary mechanism. Um, and learners often get the two confused, right? Accommodation is what happens when the lens changes its shape in order to focus on objects that are nearby or are far away. Now, normally your eye is looking at things that are more far away. So when we speak about accommodation, it's normally to look at something closer. And the closer we're talking about is anything closer than six meters. So reading a book, then your eye is experiencing accommodation. Okay, now the description for accommodation, very important. Okay, I'm going to very briefly go through it with you. Um, and if you know the one, then the other one is essentially the reverse. So I'm going to go through what happens during accommodation when you are looking at something close by. So this is the front part of the eye. The rest of the eyeball is at the back here, right? When you are looking at something close, the light doesn't have that far to travel before it must, the light rays must meet each other on the retina. So we need the light to be bent quite quickly. Now the front part of the eye, they've just cut the, the diagram cuts it, the cornea off here, but that cornea can't change shape. So when the light is bent at the cornea, that can't change, but the lens can change shape and that's going to then cause the light to bend more. So the way the lens needs to change shape or the thing that happens for the lens to change shape is all about these little ciliary muscles that are here above and below. They're actually all the way around, but when we look at a diagram from the side, we only see it above and below. And these little suspensory ligaments that hold the lens in place. Okay. Now, when you're looking at something close, these suspensory ligaments contract. And when they contract, they move towards the lens. Okay. So they move this one's going to move up towards the lens. This one's going to move down towards the lens. And as they contract and move towards the lens, these suspensory ligaments then slacken, which basically means they're not tightly stretched anymore. Okay, so they are more loose. 
And when they are more loose, they're not pulling on the lens. And when they don't pull on the lens, the tension on the lens decreases and the lens starts to become more rounded or we say that it's more convex. And the more rounded it is, the more the light is going to bend. Okay, it's going to be refracted more and focused onto the retina. Now, when you're looking at something far away, the exact opposite thing happens. So the ciliary muscles, are going to relax and when they relax they move away so they relax and these suspensory ligaments get pulled so they become tight or taut is another way of saying it and then the tension on the lens increases the lens becomes more flat or less convex and the light rays are reflect refracted less okay so this is a lot of words to study but very important that you're able to describe accommodation. Okay. Then papillary mechanism is what's happening to the size of the pupil. So here we have a pupil that is smaller, in other words, constricted, and this is a pupil and what it looks like when it is larger or we say dilated. And this happens in response to light. So accommodation is near and far. Papillary mechanism is bright light versus dim light. Okay. Now, when it's bright, when a person is exposed to bright light, they don't need to let that much light in. Remember, the pupil is the space. And the size of the space will determine how much light can come in. So if it's very bright, this is going to be constricted because we don't need to let that much light in. But when it's dimmer or more dark, then we want to let more light in so that we can see clearly, then this pupil is going to be bigger. And the thing that controls the size is the color part of the eye. So the blue or the green or the brown part of the eye around the pupil is actually a muscle. And that is going to change the size of that pupil. Okay, now I always tell my students, just like with accommodation, learn one of them really well. And the other one is just the opposite. Okay, so when you look at the, when you look at the eye, okay, and that you look at the iris, there are two groups of muscles. Okay, so I want to just quickly give you this little tip. For those of you that do um, maths and you remember what a radius is, the radius goes from the middle of the circle to the edge of the circle. So the radial muscles of the iris go from the middle out to the edge. So these are the radial muscles. And the circular muscles are the round ones because they look like little circles. Okay, so these are the circular muscles going round. Now, if you just remember that, then this process is a bit easier. So when the light is bright, we need this pupil to be small. In order for this pupil to be small, these radial muscles need to be long. Look at the difference here. These are long and these are shorter to pull the pupil open. So in bright light, the radial muscles must relax because they must get long. And these muscles work in opposition to each other, which means that the circular muscles are then contracting. The pupil gets smaller or the pupil constricts and lets less light into the eye. These four points are the things you would need to talk about. Okay. And the opposite is true here. So when we've got dim light, we want this to be big. So the radial muscles must be short. So the radial muscles must contract. The circular muscles must relax. The pupil dilates and lets more light into the eye. Okay, please note, it says radial muscles of the iris. Um, if you're answering a question like this, you must mention that the muscles are the muscles in the iris because we have radial and circular muscles in other parts of our bodies as well. Okay, right. Let's go through this question. I know it doesn't quite fit well on my screen 
here, but in your booklet, um, in the census section, it's question 1.1 for you. If you can have a look at that. For the sake of time, I'm going to go through these questions with you because there's some important things about the ear that I want to, um, to mention to you. So I'm going to do this question, some of it with you. Um, and then the next question I'm going to let you do on your own. Right. So here we're looking at um, two responses to the human eye or of the human eye to two different conditions. OK, now diagram one, we see we're looking at the front of the eye and we can see that there is a difference in the pupil size. So this diagram is about papillary mechanism. And this one, we're looking at the side and we can see the lens size is different or shape is different. So diagram two is about accommodation. OK, so identify part A. Part A is this very outside layer of the eye, which if you all quickly think for yourself what that could be. Hopefully you got that right. That's the sclera. And then B is the lens. And C is the, they will accept ciliary muscle or ciliary body. Okay, the ciliary body is inside the ciliary muscle, but they will accept both of them. Okay, quick little tip for you. Um, ciliary body or ciliary muscle sounds very similar to circular muscle. So this is also a place where you must be very careful with your spelling. Okay, not circular muscles in the iris, ciliary muscles above and below the lens for accommodation. Right, identify the process in diagram one. That's papillary mechanism or papillary reflex. The name of the part of the eye responsible for the pro a response in one. Okay, I'm going to quickly ask schools, quickly type in what you think your answer is to 113. And then if... If a school response is Yana, you can just tell me what they have said for 113. Perfect. I see we've got perseverance. They are, I don't know, maybe they didn't sleep last night, ma'am, because they are very, very, their brains are warmed up. They are saying that it would be the iris. Correct. It's the iris. Well done, perseverance. Many learners there say it's the pupil. Okay, so that's why I wanted to see what, what some of you would say. The part of the eye that changes, okay, um, size is the pupil. But remember that pupil is not actually a part of the eye. It's, it's a space. It's actually not a structure. Um, it's the gap. So the part of the eye that is responsible for changing the size of that gap is the iris, as Perseverance said. Well done. Okay, and then state the consequence of the person's vision if the process in diagram two does not occur. Okay, if this process, so in diagram two, we're going from a flat lens to a rounded lens. So we're going from seeing far to seeing close. So if this did not happen, then what will happen? The person will not be able to see nearby objects. Okay, so I want to quickly go through that again. It's just a it's just a one mark question, but they're asking state the consequence, which in other words, the result to the person's vision if the process does not occur. So they're saying if this doesn't happen, then they won't be able to see the objects nearby clearly. Another way of saying it is they'll only be able to see distant or far away objects clearly. Okay. Right. The next question I'm going to give you guys a few minutes 
to try on your own. Um, let's go with, because I still want to do those things on the ear, three minutes. Okay, let's go through these. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to, to get the answers from the chat, but thank you to those of you who have put your answers there. Um, the first question asks for the letter and name. Please note, grade 12s, this kind of question has come up a lot where you give the letter and the name and be careful that you give both. Okay, so... Um, which is the part that contains muscles, right? We can only give parts that are labeled. So it's either A, B, or C. And of those parts, the parts that contain muscles is going to be B. And they want the name of B. B is the iris. Part that is made up of tough white fibrous tissue, the only one that it could be here is A, and A is called the sclera. Then question Two says which diagram, they tell you they only want the number, represents the eye of a person in a very bright area. So remember when the light is bright, we don't need that much to enter the eye. So it's going to be diagram two. And where the rods are stimulated the most. Okay, now this one um. It's just the way they've worded the question is a little bit different because they're kind of testing you and testing more than one thing here. They're testing that you know what the rods are. The rods are those photoreceptors that help you see the difference between light and dark. So if the rods are stimulated the most, then you're wanting to see in the dark more. So we're going to look for the diagram where the pupil is the biggest because it's going to be bigger in the dark. So that's going to be diagram three. And then which controls, uh, or which muscles um, are contracted in diagram two? So in diagram two, in the iris, we're going to have various muscles that are contracted. Contracted means short. Relaxed means long. So remember I said that when we are looking at the eye with a small pupil, these radial muscles, they're going to have to be long, which means the circular ones are short and contracted. So the circular muscles are going to be contracted. And then relaxed in diagram three, here the radial muscles are going to be short and contracted and the circular muscles are going to be relaxed. So the answer for B is again circular muscles. Okay, be careful again of the spelling. Okay, 
Right, a few things in the eye. This are, well, this is just a little summary of the differences between accommodation and papillary mechanism, but I did um, cover those things. Right, I want to point out a few important things about the ear. There's only one question on the ear that I'll get you guys to do just now, but there are a few things that are important for me to, to mention here. First of all, <coughs> sorry, you have to be able to label the ear. These bones don't learn the three names of the bones. They never ask them as three separate labels, as three separate bones. So just learn uh, ossicles. Okay, so these bones just learn the label ossicles. Right. Then a few little um, common errors I'm going to go through with you or um, things that people often make mistakes on, right? People often think that this tube down here in a diagram and this um, nerve are the same. Please look on your diagram where these things are coming from because it's on a diagram it's in black and white it's not always not it's not in color like here so it makes it a bit more difficult in, a, in an exam diagram to see but the tube that's coming from the ossicles from the middle ear that is the eustachian tube the line because it also looks like a tube on the diagram coming from the inner ear from the semicircular canals or the cochlea, that is the auditory nerve. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so please don't get those two things confused. All right. Then the tympanic membrane. Um, when they ask for the, the function of the eustachian tube, many people say that the eustachian tube drains the middle ear of fluid. OK, it will do that when it has to, if there is a middle ear infection, right? But it's doing that in order to make to do its actual job. And the actual job of the eustachian tube is to maintain balance. Right. Or to equalize the pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane. So the job of the eustachian tube is often wrong um, in, in learner's scripts um, in exams. So I'm going to say the function again, and please take note. It is to equalize the pressure on, the, on either side of the tympanic membrane. So between the outer and the middle ear. Okay. Right. If we have a look at this structure, there are a few things I want to point out before I move on, when, when sound travels through the ear, it's got various forms. In the outer ear, this up until the tympanic membrane, it's a sound wave. So when you're describing hearing or you're describing anything happening, this part, sound waves. This part in the middle ear through the ossicles, you can't talk about sound waves anymore. Now you must talk about vibrations. Okay, because the tympanic membrane vibrates and it causes vibrations to be passed through the ossicles, not sound waves. Okay, then the oval window, this last little bone vibrates against the oval window and the vibration of the oval window sets up pressure waves in the cochlea so in the middle uh, in the inner ear over here in the cochlea now you must talk about pressure waves okay and then the function another common error is the round window the function of the round window so these pressure waves are moving through the cochlea and the round window absorbs the excess pressure waves but lots of people just say absorbs excess pressure Okay, not just pressure, pressure waves. Okay, so sound waves here, vibrations here, pressure waves here. 
Okay. And this part of the ear is for hearing, and this part of the ear is for balance. Anything coming from the cochlea and hearing is going to the cerebrum part of the brain because it's a sense. Anything coming from here, this, uh, the semicircular canals for balance, balance is about coordination. So that is going to the cerebellum. Okay, I'm not going to go through this, but this just goes through each part of the ear and what they do. And when you study, you must make sure that each little part of the ear, you're able to say, this is what it is and this is what it does. Okay. This is just um, a little summary of the different parts of the ear and then showing you where you must call it sound waves, vibrations and pressure waves, which I went through with you on the other the other diagram. Okay. Um, then when we talk about the receptors that are stimulated, okay, if we're talking about hearing, hearing is interpreted or at least is received in the cochlea, right? And the receptors in the cochlea are called the organ of corti. So when they ask you, or if they ask you anything about what are the receptors stimulated during hearing or the receptors stimulated in the cochlea, then you're going to say organ of corti. They will also accept hair cells. Then in the semicircular canals, this is the part um, that is all about balance and equilibrium. You've got two different parts to this whole um, area. You've got the ampulla, which have the crista in them. And the crista is for um, the kind of positioning of the head. Oh, sorry, the, um, the speed and movement of the head, of the direction of the head. And the macula is for the position of the head in relation to gravity. Okay, and these receptors, crista and macula, they are going to be interpreted by the cerebellum. Right, crista and macula are the two important words. Right, they don't actually expect you to know that the crista are in the ampulla, and they don't expect that you know that the macula are in the utriculus and the sacculus. You just need to know the word crista and macula and what they do. Okay, um, this is just a nice little... Um, way of remembering which one does which. So the crista is for the direction and speed of, of the head, and the macula is for the position of the head with regards to gravity. Right, the slideshows will be sent to you, so you'll get that little summary if you don't have it. Okay, we've got five minutes left, and in those five minutes, I would like you to take three minutes to answer these few questions and then we will go through them.
Okay. Um, I see there's a little mark allocation error on here. Th one, three, two, B should only be for two marks, not for three marks. Um, let's go through it quickly. So this is an example of how they can ask you a question on the ear. They don't always give you the whole ear diagram. They sometimes just give you a section of it. And they've asked to identify part A. So A are those semicircular canals. And B is the auditory nerve. Remember, it's coming off the cochlea and going towards the brain, tra tra transmitting impulses. So it's the auditory nerve. And then 132, they want the letter and the name which of the part that creates pressure waves in the fluid of the inner ear. Okay, now it's not asking, read the question carefully with me, it's not asking where are the pressure waves. It's asking the part that creates the pressure waves. So we know that the pressure waves are in the cochlea, but the part that makes them and sets up the pressure waves is either oval window. Okay, so remember, this is the part where the ossicles vibrate against the oval window and it creates the pressure waves in the inner ear. Absorbs excess pressure waves. So the pressure waves that aren't converted into a sound impulse or a, an impulse for hearing, they get absorbed by the D round window. Okay. I don't know why the D got cut off there, but the answer there is D round window. Also want to just point out to you from a learning perspective, um, within this question, they've basically given the two functions of the round window. So when you study, the functions of the round window is absorb excess pressure waves. And another function is prevent formation of an echo. Okay, that's a little tip there for you. And then 133, the part of the brain that interprets the impulses from F. Okay, F is going to be where the crystal are. So it's about balance and equilibrium. So it's the cerebellum. Remember, sorry, don't just say brain, which part of the brain. So cerebellum. And then the last question was the receptors found at C. Those receptors are the organ of corti or hair cells. Okay, and with that, on our very last question, that brings us to 10 o'clock. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to go through all those Section A questions from the, from the nervous system, but I think it was better that we managed to get through some important things on the eye and the ear. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much. 